Good morning, everyone. I'm Carl Holt, filling in for Pastor Burke today. Um, thank you for those that can be here and those online. Please join me in our opening hymn, We Know That Christ is Raised. Gracious Father has heard our cry for mercy. He sent his son to die on a cross to pay for our sins. His rising from the dead proves payment is finished. Therefore, as a servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. This holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
heaven at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan. You proclaimed him, your beloved son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 6. The servant of the Lord. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a shepherd, a sharpened sword. In the shadows of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
Our second reading is from Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. What shall we say, then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the Jordan River John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey and this was his message after me comes the one more powerful than I the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by the John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Thank you. 
the sermon, we will be having a video sermon today. Friends in Christ, it's that time of the year. As I mentioned, school will be starting soon, and the transition or the page starts to turn to the second semester. If you are a seventh or eighth grader, the page begins to be turned to where am I going to go to high school? As you get to be a junior and senior in high school, and you're taking the ACT, the SAT, and whatever T, whatever test you're taking, it becomes the what will I do after high school? Will I go into the trades? Will I go into the military? Will I go or be accepted into the college that I want? And then when you're in the college level, you're wondering, okay, am I going to get or find the job that I want? Many of us are there or are getting there as parents or maybe with grandparents or even as adults. I will ask you the question, are you doing exactly what you wanted to do when you were a child? We've heard the answers up here. NFL player, veterinarian, dancer, teacher. For me, when I was younger, I wanted to be the captain of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> that didn't work. A backup plan for me was to be one of the regulars on Saturday Night Live. That didn't work. And then I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And, you know, people always ask that question of, when did you know you wanted to be a pastor? There was no Apostle Paul knocking me off the horse and Jesus calling me moment. But there was a time when I bickered in Green Bay, Wisconsin. That is where life changed. And that is where I met Pastor Paulo. And he was someone who encouraged me greatly to say, yeah, stick with this, this ministry thing. Today in our text that Pastor, Pastor Graf read for us, it's from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and I need you to understand, as he said it, I, I appreciate that Pastor even mentioned that, that he said that there is a dialogue going on between the Father and the Son. So I want you to picture this for a moment, and it's probably happened or will happen that sometime there is a father, a son, a mother, and, and, and a child, or a, a school counselor, and a student sitting and talking about their future, and what do you want to do? In our text, Isaiah, several hundred years before Jesus ever walked the face of the earth physically, was privy to a conversation between the Father and the Son, and what is unique is Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do when he grew up. He was equipped to be a servant and to have an impact. In the Wisconsin Synod, we have a unique way of calling our pastors and teachers. It's funny if you ever talk to people outside of our calling circle and you try explaining to them the call process. It sometimes boggles their mind. They're like, what, you, you, you just can't go to a church and apply? No. So what do they do? And I smile and I say, well, Big Brother has been watching us for quite a while. And then I have to go on to explain what that means, because when you are in high school, some of your teachers start to identify some of your strengths, right, in, in areas where you're weak. When you're in college, that ramps up a little more. And then at the seminary, it's even more intense to when you go out and vicar, which is your intern year, your vicar report then comes back with, here is where this person will excel as a called worker. And that gets put into practice then on most of the calls. Case in point, you don't ever have to worry that if the call comes for me to be a pastor, but also lead the choir and be a music director, <coughs> Not happening. That's not my gift. 
But again, as I know in this uh, congregation, you throw a rock and it'll probably hit a pastor. Each one of them can tell you what their unique skill set is and the places they served and how they filled those skills. Well, Jesus, you have to understand in this text, has a specific skill set. And what's going on is the fact that there are a group of people that do not want to follow God's laws. They look at God's laws as the buzzkill and, oh, now we can't have fun. And now on the other side, you have a God who then looks at those people and says they should all perish because of their sin. All right, Jesus, go to work. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus was born to do, to bring the two warring parties together. If you listen again to what Isaiah wrote, he said, listen to me, you islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of the hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. You see, Jesus wasn't given a manual of how to, you know, get along with difficult people. But he had the word. I want you to think for a moment of Jesus' ministry. I know we're coming fresh off of baby Jesus, but think of when Jesus right, started his ministry, especially after our gospel lesson. What was his ministry consisting of? Speaking the law to people who thought they were self-righteous and didn't need him. And again, not just the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, he would speak to his own disciples who would argue about who was the greatest, and he would need to put them in their place. But then he was so quick so quick with the gospel to tell that Samaritan woman that he is the Messiah to tell that woman that the people were throw, going to throw stones at that he is her savior yeah Jesus was equipped to do that think of his ministry as well his ministry again his first year of ministry a little more obscure people were Hey, is this that carpenter's son from Nazareth? To his second year of ministry where he's at rock star fame and crowds are following him everywhere. To his third year of ministry where he knows the end is near and he often withdraws to a quiet place. Yes, Jesus was equipped to be that servant. What about you? I want you to, to think for a moment again. I know 2024 is still fresh, but what kind of year are you having so far? A little more obscure? Are you at the popularity status where everything's going well, right? Job, family, life, yes. Or are you in a moment where you just want to wanna get away? Maybe I, I should ask the question of us, too. What message do, do we need to hear? Do we need to, to hear the law where, well, again, when, when a, a pastor speaks specifically uh, about a sin and, and we kind of go, hey, he's probably talking about, and then we fail to see that it's you and me that are just as guilty? Or are we so downtrodden and, and so <clears throat> that we beat ourselves up that, that how could God ever love someone like me? Well, he can, and he does by his love and his grace. But your sins are forgiven. And you too are an equipped servant of God. When I would teach in the high school, and I would have the opportunity to talk to students, and they'd ask me, questions about occupation and then they tell me what they were thinking about going into and then I would be quick to ask them why do you want to go into this occupation you know and they'd be like to make money 
I, a lot of them would be honest and say they want to help people. They want to make a difference. They want to glorify God. When Jesus came into this world, he knew exactly what he was going to do. And he was going to have an impact on people's lives. As we see in our text, it says here, And now the Lord says, Who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. Jesus knew exactly what he had to do, and that was right the wrong that started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell into sin, and then there was the promise of a Savior, and then there was Abraham, and then there was Isaac, and then there was Jacob and the children of Israel, the people that are hearing this text for the first time when Isaiah would write it and speak to them, that there is hope, that Jesus was coming, that the Savior has come and will come, and the impact that Jesus had would be to be the Savior. And what's more, he would be the Savior not just of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. That's where we come in. The text says, Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribe of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. When I think of that impact, that the fact that, that God sent his son not just to die for one nation, but to die for everyone, and that everybody can hear the gospel and everybody can be a child of God, I don't know if you caught that in our second reading in the Acts reading Paul was out doing missionary work and sometimes missionary work you think well it's just I'm going to go door to door I'm going to go you know it was in jail and sometimes the most unlikely spot that God used Paul and put him in the right spot at the right time to have the impact to share with that jailer the news of Jesus so that that person could be saved. It's an impact you and I can have too. How'd you get here? By a car. <laughs> yeah. No. Humor me. How did you get here? Who told you about Jesus? Who told them about Jesus? And you know where I'm going with this. Who told them? Because it started right here in Jerusalem. And like a stone that drops into the water and that ripple effect that here we are in West Bend, January 7th. And I want to know where the ripples are going next. You may say, well, I, I, I don't know. Friends, you go back to the text, and, and this is just pure gold right here. What was it that made Jesus and helped Jesus through his difficult times? What is it that helps you and me through our difficult times? Isaiah says that my reward is with my God. My God has been my strength. Think about that and marinate on that, especially, again, whatever moment we're in, in in our life right now, that our reward is with our God. And our God has been our strength. Take that with you. Now, when you go into the world and there's moments of highs and lows that you can say that with confidence because Jesus said it, And it's true. As you leave here today, I want you to think of something. The wise men, right? It's Epiphany, and so we got to mention the wise men. They finally made it. They brought gold, incense, and myrrh as gifts to Jesus. What gift has God given? given you. You have gifts, no doubt about that. 
And how are you going to use those gifts to impact others, to keep that ripple going? This year, and until the Lord takes us home to be with him. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> Please rise for the night's <coughs> We believe in one Lord God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified for the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Join me in the, in the prayer of the church. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son who sits at your right hand in glory. Comfort us with the promise of your eternal presence. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and your desire to live according to your will. Take away our love of sinning and restore us each day by your grace. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Give us courage to carry the cross with patience and joy. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Mold us and move us to be good examples for our youth. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they love. Move us to pray for these brothers and sisters and to help when we can. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We will now give
give thanks with our offering. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks. O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lived among us as a human being and revealed his glory as your only Son, full of grace and truth. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave his, his, to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given to death for your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and eat.
take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and the holy precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in the joy and peace of forgiveness. Amen.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us a pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we are willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated.
be thankful that I have the opportunity to be up here. And I thank you guys, and I thank God for that opportunity. Um, a couple of announcements today. Today we will be taking down the Christmas tree. Um, we're going to ask if anybody could help us out with it to save some time. Uh, I think Penny m might need the help. Um, there are still openings on the flower chart for this year. Check that out if you would like and sign up. Um, the altar flowers adorning the altar um, are from June Haller in memory of her husband, Tom. Uh, there is a voters meeting Sunday, January 28th, right after church. If you would, please join us for that. And Carl, can I just add to that? Yeah, sure can. The, the voters meeting? Yes. So we know that the voters meeting is, is you know, the men voting, but uh, we really do value, and there's a lot of benefit to everybody who can be here, so we appreciate everybody who can show up. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. 